Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are in the world, and welcome to the second day of the 33rd Regulatory Information Conference. I'm Andrea Bell, Acting Director of the Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation and co-sponsor of this conference. And I'm Ray Furstenau, the Director of the Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research and the other co-sponsor of the RIC. We're excited to bring you day two of the virtual RIC. Since yesterday morning, over 600 more people have registered, bringing our total registration to over 4,200 from, from 50 countries. And we're glad all of you are here. Thanks, Ray. It was very enlightening to hear the remarks from Chairman Hansen yesterday and the morning technical session on the NRC's transformation journey, the session on transformation and modernization of the NRC environmental review processes, the preparations for export of advanced reactors, and all that was covered really had several high profile topics that are of interest to internal and external stakeholders. And I do wanna take a minute to address a few housekeeping items. First of all, yesterday at the end of the chairman's plenary, I noted that the staff would post answers to questions submitted by attendees that didn't have time to address, that we didn't have time to address. That was my mistake. We don't intend to respond to all questions submitted via the virtual RIC platform. As you can imagine, that would be a astronomical workload. However, our technical session chairs do receive the complete list of questions and may choose to respond directly to you or post some answers at their discretion. If you have that burning question that doesn't get answered that you really want answered during technical sessions, you're always free to reach out to the contacts listed for those technical sessions and the digital exhibits. Second, yesterday there, there were some difficulties with viewing some of the session feeds. If you have difficulties closing your browser and re-logging in to the RIC conference website, we usually solve any issues. And finally, unfortunately, we did have some technical difficulties at the beginning of yesterday afternoon's technical session risk-informed decision-making across disciplines that caused the session to start about 15 minutes late. The nature of the malfunction also prevented us from posting a message noting the technical difficulties, which was very unfortunate. Our apologies for any disruption this may have caused, and we hope that many of you were able to join and view the session in its entirety once the technical issues were resolved. For those that missed it, all of the RIC sessions are recorded and will be made available in the coming weeks. We hope that you'll have a chance to view the re recording. And the irony is definitely not lost on me that the risk session was the one that had the technical delay, but the team was risk smart and pressed forward. Ray? Yeah, thanks, Andrea. Hey, I wanted to spend a few minutes uh, uh, talking about some of uh, what I thought were highlights of of yesterday's afternoon sessions. Uh, I was uh, honored to introduce Margie Doan's uh, plenary session called Challenge to Opportunity, what we can learn uh, from the race for a vaccine and her discussion with uh, Dr. John Mascola, the director of the Vaccine Research uh, Center at the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Mascola he talked about uh, a fully integrated approach to their vaccine work at the NIH and, and the importance of understanding the mission, being prepared for the missions ahead, even when they don't quite know what they're going to be yet, and having a sense of purpose in the organization. He also emphasized the importance of creativity and collaboration in, in their mission work and the ability to translate their cutting edge research into life-saving life products. I, I, think, I think the leadership and organization traits he talked about and, and what Margie emphasized can, can all be related to the safety and security missions at the NRC. So I think it was a very, he, he was an excellent uh, discussion, uh, excellent uh, guest to have and Margie, melded it in really nicely to, to what we do at the NRC. So I thought it was a great session. Uh, yesterday afternoon, uh, I chaired a technical session on the NRC's uh, future-focused research and integrated university programs. 
I think one of the things that uh, impressed me most uh, from our NRC panelists and as well as our Oregon State University colleague was their enthusiasm for leading and conducting these modest uh, but, but potentially very impactful research activities that will help us be ready for future nuclear technologies and, and applications of those technologies. I think the university uh, faculty and, and student involvement in, a, in our new mission-related R&D grants that we started in fiscal year 20 is, is really exciting, and I'm, look, I'm really looking to the, forward to the future in that. I was also able to tune into the daily wrap-up on risk deconstruction, and uh, as always, uh, Alicia Bone did a great job of hosting this conversation with uh, Joe Donahue, Mina Khanna, and Brian Kemper. Uh, Andrea? Yeah, thanks, Ray. Yesterday was very successful despite the technical glitches that we had, and you did a really great wrap up of both sessions. And today we're looking forward to hearing from two of our NRC commissioners for their plenary sessions Commissioner Jeff Barron and Commissioner Andy Caputo. We'll also have two sets of concurrent technical sessions covering a wide range of interesting topics. Today's morning technical sessions span the topics of accident tolerant fuel, and that'll be chaired by Chairman Hansen, reactor cybersecurity, and international nuclear regulatory trans transformation. Right? Yeah, I, I recall that in his opening uh, remarks, Chairman Hansen mentioned about uh, accident tolerant fuel as being one of his priorities. So I think it's a, a very fitting that he's chairing chairing the, the session today on accident tolerant fuel. Uh, this afternoon's technical sessions uh, span the topics of the evolution of external hazard risks to reactors, uh, long-term reactor operational issues, medical isotope production, facility licensing, and our always popular reactor oversight session with our four regional administrators. Andrea? Thanks, Ray. I'm sure the ROP session will be widely attended, and I really look forward to hearing from our regional administrators. They have a wealth of knowledge and information, and collectively, they really do watch what's happening in the field, and I enjoy getting their insights in our monthly meetings and learning about what's going on in the regions because they are the eyes and ears, and the inspectors are the boots on the ground. So I really enjoy and plan to uh, attend that session myself. Following today's formal program, a live daily wrap-up talk show called Staff Talks will be broadcast at 2.45 p.m. Eastern Time. Each day's show will have a specific theme, and today's theme is risk, overcoming the fear of failure, where staff will discuss how initiatives successfully evolve through trial and error. Right? Yeah, each morning, Andrea will also feature one of the digital exhibits that are available on the uh, RIC platform. So please check those out. Um, this morning, I'd like to highlight the exhibit, uh, Five Ways the NRC's Office of Public Affairs Communicates with Stakeholders. This interactive presentation allows our viewers to discover and learn about the Office of Public Affairs and its role in communicating with stakeholders. Five areas of focus include transparency, information and education, social media, crisis communication, and our OPA staff. And don't forget to take a virtual tour of the NRC Operations Center. You know, Andrea, as we look into uh, the first day of the RIC, I think we're all kind of uh, figuring out how best to use the virtual platform. And, and I know one advantage of it, uh, uh, that I've seen is being able to uh, jump back and forth to uh, different technical sessions and, and, and catch multiple uh, uh, discussions. Uh, and, and as you know, we have recorded all of the sessions. So if you, if you miss one or you wanted to go to two that were in the same time frame, you can always go back and, and look at the recording from the session. So I ask uh, everyone to take advantage of the virtual platform and uh, enjoy the uh, sessions yesterday uh, from, from yesterday as well as today and tomorrow and Thursday. Uh, Andrea? 
And I want to give you a shout out, Ray. You had um, an experience yesterday that I haven't had yet. You had to go from a plenary session right to your technical session. And a little birdie told me that you got there in less than one minute and it was pretty seamless. So yeah, I was I was kind of out of breath on that one when I ran over to the to my other session. So uh, yeah, it was a challenge, but it worked out. It worked out great. Andrea, how about it you? I was wondering. Like, um, Ray, Ray, you were freezing. I was wondering. Bit, uh, I'm sorry, Andrea. No, I was saying you were locking up a bit, but I want you to go ahead and, and finish. Okay, I just wanted to, uh, uh, was curious on how, how the sessions worked for you, the, the technical sessions. It went very well. I'm becoming an expert at multitasking with the Zoom platform that the NRC people are on and all the speakers, with the external platform that the audience sees, with the moderator screen for the questions, and just any various notes. And I had to tell my staff to cut it out on Teams. I was getting a lot of Teams messages yesterday, and it was becoming a bit of a distraction, so I was able to kind of focus, and then also I had to send my whining dog to the basement, so I think everything worked out well. Yeah, I think those are all kind of uh, the trials and tribulations of, uh, of uh, being virtual on these things. I think everybody's pretty understanding of that. Uh, thanks, Andrea. Absolutely. And one of the things we were talking about earlier before we came onto this platform is even with the few glitches that we've had during this session yesterday, I think people are very grateful that we were able to, to have a RIC because we had to cancel last year at the last minute because we were actually at the beginning and didn't know how serious COVID was. But in hindsight, we made the right decision. And to be able to pivot to this virtual platform now and to do it virtually um, without any issues, I think is a credit. You heard me say yesterday, we'll um, thank the, the team that put together the RIC, all of our support staff, our core team throughout the day. Every chance that I get to thank them, everyone who's involved, the contractors, I will do that. So you'll hear it again tomorrow and you'll definitely hear it again as we progress through the conference, right? Yeah, we, we owe them a lot, uh, Andrea, to make this go seamlessly for us. And uh, uh, also the, you know, all the external participants, uh, those, those folks that are participating with us from around the world, the external speakers we have and the presenters, uh, we wanna give them a big thanks uh, as well. And I think um, one of the things that will come out of this conference and is certainly coming out of various technical areas at the NRC is what are the lessons learned based on being in, in the COVID situation and, and being, you know, working at home and what efficiencies have we gained? We're definitely going to learn lessons from how we put on this conference. This is historical. This is the first time we've ever done this. We're all learning. And I think just from the first day, it has been monumental and to have a RIC that is the highest attended in terms of registration in the history of the RIC it, is pretty remarkable. So I think we, we will you know, have several lessons to learn from this. Yes, I agree. And also, I think um, as we get closer to the introductions for Commissioner Barron, I just want to take an opportunity to, to thank every single person that um, prepared me for this role. Many people don't know that um, Hongi, when he departed, um, I had to come up to speed quickly to, to step in to host this Rick. So I do want to take the opportunity to thank everyone who got me up to speed and able to, um, you know, step in and host the Rick. It's been my honor to do, and I look forward to the rest of the time. And with that, I'm going to um, begin my introductions for our first speaker of the day, which is Commissioner Jeff Barron. The Honorable Jeff Barron was nominated by President Obama and sworn in as a commissioner on October 14, 2014. He is currently serving a term ending on June 30th, 2023. During his tenure on the commission, Commissioner Barron's priorities have included maintaining a strong focus on safety and security, improving oversight of power reactors, entering decommissioning, boosting the openness and transparency of agency decision-making, promoting diversity and inclusion at the agency 
and preparing to review and oversee the safety of new technologies. In fact, he will be moderating the artificial intelligence technical session during the RIC. Commissioner Barron has visited dozens of NRC licensed facilities. He also traveled to Fukushima Daiichi for a first-hand look at conditions and activities at the site. Before serving on the commission, Commissioner Barron worked for the U.S. House of Representatives for over 11 years. Originally from the Chicago area, Commissioner Barron earned a bachelor's degree and master's degree in political science from Ohio University. He holds a law degree from Harvard Law School. Commissioner Barron, we're looking forward to hearing your remarks. Thanks, Andrea. Good morning. It's great to be with you all uh, at another RIC. Uh, it would be nice, of course, to see you all in person, uh, but this virtual conference is still a great opportunity to share what's happening at the agency and hear from interested stakeholders. An unfortunate casualty of a virtual plenary, however, is humor. At the 2019 RIC, to meet your unending demands for humor and RIC speeches, I turned to New Reg 0544, NRC's legendary collection of abbreviations. I had planned to continue our journey through NRC's universe of abbreviations in 2020. Alas, that RIC was canceled due to the pandemic. Rather than getting back to the abbreviations in 2021, I have grudgingly opted to hold off until next year. Let's face it, it's just not the same if we can't hear the groans and the chuckles. So that will be something for us to look forward to with bated breath, I'm sure, in 2022. For now, I want to focus on three pressing challenges affecting NRC and really the world. They are the fight against climate change, the response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and the pursuit of environmental justice. Policymakers and the public are increasingly focused on the climate crisis and on dramatically reducing carbon emissions. President Biden has made it a priority to put the United States on a path to eliminate carbon emissions in the electric sector by 2035 and achieve a net zero economy by 2050. Many states and utilities have adopted similar targets. The urgency and scale of the climate challenge have led to a public debate about the available emission reduction technologies and the role of nuclear power. Obviously, NRC is not charged with setting broad energy policy. We don't get involved in decisions about the electricity market design, carbon pricing, or electricity generation portfolios. Our focus is on ensuring the safety and security of whatever amount of nuclear power is used. But I think it's clear that meeting these ambitious climate goals will involve nuclear power. I see NRC's nexus to climate change in two main areas, the operating fleet and new reactors. For the long-term operation of existing nuclear power plants, NRC's role is to provide strong safety and security standards and rigorous independent oversight. In recent years, there has been a counterproductive emphasis on reducing inspections, cutting costs, and creating ever more restrictive backfit constraints on agency action. We need a course correction. We need to refocus on safety and the basic value of oversight. Instead of pursuing reductions in the frequency or number of comprehensive engineering inspections, problem identification and resolution inspections, and force-on-force -force physical security inspections, we need to pursue changes that will improve NRC oversight, not weaken it. The reactor oversight process has never been static, and I don't think it should be, but the ROP has generally been an effective safety framework. When we consider changes, NRC needs to be careful that we don't damage a program that has been working well or make changes that result in unintended consequences. This program affects every operating reactor in the country, and our number one priority must be the safety and security impact of our decisions. So how should we evaluate potential changes to safety standards or inspections? It is, it's important to continue to take advantage of risk insights in our regulatory decision-making. And if we're going to make a particular change, there should be a solid safety case for the change based on operating experience, inspection experience, and the judgment of our inspectors and experts. We should not adjust safety standards or oversight based mainly on cost considerations without a strong safety case. Safety is NRC's core responsibility. Shifting resources from lower risk items to higher risk items can improve oversight, but that assumes that there is a shift in resources and not an overall cut. It's also important to remember that oversight positively impacts performance. 
improvements in plant or fleet performance don't occur in a vacuum. NRC standards and inspections contribute significantly to those improvements. That's one reason why a period of good performance doesn't justify weakening safety standards or cutting inspections. This might be easier to see if we step out of the nuclear context for a minute. According to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, there has been a general downward trend in traffic fatalities over the past 40 years. But that isn't a reason to stop requiring seatbelts or airbags or infant car seats. The opposite is true. Those requirements are a big part of the reason for that positive safety trend. And just because there wasn't a major E. coli or salmonella outbreak in a given year doesn't mean USDA stops inspecting food. Those inspections are vital, even if you've been having a good year. Of course, there's room for innovation, for risk informing, for real efficiencies in the ROP. We don't need to settle for the status quo. If we keep our focus on safety, we can make the right kind of changes. Instead of reducing the frequency of comprehensive engineering inspections, the annual engineering inspections should focus on different and often uninspected safety significant areas each year. This would give the NRC staff the flexibility to shift the engineering inspection focus to areas of emerging need as the nuclear power plant fleet ages and adopts new technologies. Rather than reducing the frequency of problem identification and resolution inspections, we should find ways to make this important inspection more effective at spotting corrective action program weaknesses and better able to promptly detect any adverse trends in a plant's safety culture. We should also take a fresh look at the Cross-Cutting Issues Program. The purpose of the program is to determine whether a nuclear power plant has an issue with human performance, safety-conscious work environment, or problem identification or resolution that affects all aspects of operating the plant. These focus areas are all vital to the safe operations of a nuclear power plant. But the threshold for identifying a cross-cutting theme at a plant is currently very high. For example, it could take 20 overall human performance findings at a plant during a one-year period to trigger any action under the program. As a result, the thresholds have rarely been met, even at plants that later had major performance problems. The idea behind the cross-cutting issues program is good, but we need to make it more effective. NRC needs to be open to and ready for new technologies that could improve safety. Whether it's digital instrumentation and control, accident tolerant fuels, sensors, or advanced manufacturing techniques, we need to establish a reliable and predictable regulatory framework for reviewing these technologies while ensuring that they are adopted safely without, without introducing any unacceptable risks. That's also true for the increased use of artificial intelligence and data analytics. There are a number of potential applications of these technologies in the nuclear sector that could increase both safety and efficiency. I'll be chairing a technical session Thursday morning at 1030 on this topic and hope you'll join us for an engaging and informative discussion. NRC also needs to focus on the impacts of climate change on nuclear power plants. The recent blackout in Texas and other parts of the country highlights how the changing climate can create vulnerabilities in electric generation assets and the grid. Once in a century, extreme weather events are now occurring with disturbing regularity. In the case of Texas, extreme cold challenged generation assets in one of the four reactors in the state had to shut down for a period of time because the cold temperatures disrupted the feed water system. But scientists tell us that extreme temperatures are not the only hazard exacerbated by climate change. Flooding, hurricanes, and snow and ice loads are expected to pose greater, challenge, greater challenges to nuclear power plants and the grid in the future than they have in the past. NRC has launched a key initiative to keep up with the latest science of natural hazards. The staff has established a more routine, proactive, and systematic program for identifying and evaluating new information related to natural hazards. The agency is now collecting, aggregating, and assessing new scientific information about a range of natural hazards on an ongoing basis. The staff is expanding its knowledge base for several types of natural hazards, through active and ongoing technical engagement with other federal agencies, academia, industry, international counterparts, professional societies, and consensus standards organizations. When the staff obtains new information about a natural hazard, they assess its potential significance in the context of the accumulated hazard information rather than in isolation. The ultimate goal is to determine if the new information could have a potentially significant effect on plant safety. This is important work. Our regulatory processes need to account 
for the changing frequency, intensity, and duration of extreme weather events caused by climate change. In my view, preparing nuclear power plants for the impacts of climate change also will require the Commission to revisit the post-Fukushima mitigation of beyond design basis events regulation. The rule that was finalized in early 2019 did not require the flex equipment at nuclear power plants to be reasonably protected from the up-to-date flooding and earthquake hazards. Licensees and the NRC staff spent years using the latest science to determine the present-day flooding and earthquake hazards. Unfortunately, the current regulation allows a nuclear power plant flex strategy to disregard these reevaluated hazards and be prepared for only the old, outdated hazards. With the changing climate, flooding risks are not static. It makes no sense to allow licensees to rely on obsolete flood hazard estimates, most of which were calculated decades ago. That is the opposite of what we should be doing to prepare for the altered climate of the future. I think there's broad agreement that the flex equipment is the single biggest post-Fukushima safety improvement at nuclear power plants. But the equipment doesn't do anyone any good if it doesn't work when called upon. And that means protecting the equipment from entirely predictable natural hazards. To adequately protect the public, NRC must ensure that the flex equipment has the resilience to survive the real earthquake and flooding hazards facing nuclear power plants. NRC also needs to make sure that plants are ready and able to use the equipment if they need to. That means adequate communications and staffing. It also means exercises and drills. The current regulation does not require any of these common sense and non-controversial measures. As we take stock of the work we have all done to improve nuclear safety in the 10 years since the Fukushima accident, it is time to address these gaps in our current regulations. The other main climate-related role for NRC is the licensing and oversight of new reactors. Here, our main goal is to establish the right regulatory framework for the review and safe operation of new technologies such as advanced reactors. NRC's current power reactor regulations were written for light water reactors, which make up the entire existing fleet. It makes sense to update those requirements to address different technologies. Creating a regulatory framework for non-light water reactors will enable the agency to perform effective and efficiency in licensing reviews and oversight while provide, providing regulatory certainty for potential applicants and vendors. New reactor designs have the potential to be safer than existing designs. Here's the challenge. In our regulations, we need to strike a reasonable balance between taking into account the value of new safety attributes and maintaining a prudent degree of defense in depth. Some elements of NRC's existing regulations for large light water reactors will not be appropriate for non-light water reactors. Other requirements reflect enduring defense and depth principles that should apply to advanced reactors, such as the need for appropriate emergency planning and siting. To protect the public from low probability, high consequence events, these key defense and depth elements should continue to play an important role, even for designs that the NRC staff determines are safer than current designs. This is especially true for new technologies without operating experience. Multiple independent layers of protection against potential radiological exposure are necessary because we do not have perfect knowledge of new reactor technologies and their unique accident scenarios. Unlike light water reactors, new advanced reactor designs do not have decades of operating experience. In many cases, the new designs have never been built or operated before. It's reasonable to expect that the agency and licensees will have much to learn about the issues, risks, and accident sequences particular to each new design. With the current fleet of light water reactors, we learned over time that some accident scenarios were more important than initially predicted. Large break, loss of coolant accidents were thought to be the most severe potential design basis accidents until a small break loss of coolant accident occurred at Three Mile Island. As operating experience continued to accumulate, it also became apparent that on-site and off-site electric power was less reliable than expected and the station blackout scenario was found to be an important contributor to the overall risk of nuclear power plant accidents. A key lesson of this decades-long learning curve is that we should not drop independent layers of defense for novel technologies simply because we are convinced today that a new design will be safer than existing light water reactor designs. We need to strike the right balance. Responding to the COVID-19 pandemic is another major priority for the agency. This challenge is obviously not unique to NRC or our licensees. It is hard to overstate the impact the virus has had on nearly all aspects of our everyday lives in every sector of the economy. 
To continue our work, the agency has been largely operating virtually with almost all of the headquarters and regional staff teleworking. Fortunately, we've had the IT in place to carry on effectively. The staff has spent a considerable amount of time reviewing exemption requests from licensees and thinking through which requirements should temporarily not apply during the public health emergency. The toughest balance for NRC to strike has been on inspections. We want to keep agency inspectors and licensee staff healthy while conducting the vital oversight activities the American public expects from us. For the first few months of the pandemic, NRC was conducting very few in-person safety and security inspections. At most nuclear power plants, our resident inspector, inspectors were on site far less than usual. And there were almost no regional team inspections happening. I appreciate that the staff has focused on getting the resident inspectors back on site and on generally getting back to in-person safety inspections. The staff set a goal of meeting the minimum samples for the reactor oversight process baseline inspections in 2020. With very few exceptions, that goal was met. For 2021, the staff is aiming to get back to normal inspection samples. I think that's the right target, and I know the NRC staff will do everything it can to meet this objective while protecting our inspectors and those with whom they interact. Due to the unique risks of conducting full force-on-force -force inspections at nuclear power plants during the pandemic, the agency relied on limited scope physical security exercises for several months. As conditions have improved, we're restarting force-on-force -force inspections. For now, we're conducting just one triennial exercise at each plant. I look forward to returning to the normal complement of two force-on-force -force exercises per plant as soon as practical. Based on my conversations with NRC inspectors and managers, there seems to be a renewed recognition of the value of in-person safety and security inspections. Whether it's the ability to walk down safety-related equipment, talk informally with plant employees, observe operations firsthand, or the intangible but really, really very real effect of having inspectors with an NRC hard hat visible around the plant. Technologies that allow inspectors to monitor plant conditions remotely are a valuable tool, but are not a substitute for in-person inspection. NRC must also pursue environmental justice with determination and an openness to the voices of disadvantaged communities that have not always had a seat at the table. During the last 10 months, the discussion of race in this country has changed dramatically. George Floyd's death after a white police officer knelt on his neck for nearly nine minutes, launched protests and crucial discussions about racial inequality. The deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and so many other black men, women, and children as a result of violence fueled by racial injustice have shined a spotlight on the pressing need for racial equity. We cannot hope to achieve racial equity without environmental justice. NRC must meet the moment. We must be ambitious. We cannot settle for doing things the way they've always been done. We need to ask tough questions about our programs and procedures to understand if they are serving disadvantaged communities or instead creating barriers for them to overcome. The reality is that in NRC's licensing decisions, environmental justice is basically only addressed in one section of an environmental impact statement. That minimal treatment doesn't inspire confidence that environmental justice factors are having a meaningful impact on the agency's ultimate decisions. We need to ask ourselves whether and how that should change. Our adjudicatory procedures have been called strict by design. Is that just another way of saying that the agency has made it very hard for interested stakeholders, including disadvantaged communities, to have their concerns addressed in a hearing? Has the agency created a set of rules that effectively erects barriers? and excludes the voices of communities that lack the resources and the legal or technical expertise to surmount a series of complex procedural hurdles? Or the process governing petitions seeking agency enforcement action? Is that system really set up to advance equity and make it straightforward for disadvantaged communities to raise concerns and trigger agency action? If we're committed to viewing our historic practices through the lens of environmental justice, these are just some of the questions we should be asking about the way the agency has traditionally operated. Our first task should be to figure out what a systematic review of the agency's programs and policies should look like. Our goal should be to achieve significant, tangible results in the areas of equity and environmental justice. Climate change, COVID-19, environmental justice. We have a lot of work ahead of us but I'm confident that NRC will do its part to tackle these challenges. We can't do the work alone though. We need your ideas, creativity, and energy. 
Hopefully, we will soon be able to interact in person at meetings, site visits, and future RICs. In the meantime, I look forward to more opportunities to engage virtually. I also invite you to follow me on Twitter. My username is at Jeff Barron NRC. And with that shameless plug, we have time for your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner. And if you don't mind, I'd like to start with a logistical question that came up and I can actually answer it, so I'll be quick. Um, it says, will the recorded versions of the sessions be available indefinitely? And um, post rec the website will contain the information until the May, June timeframe. And then under past rec information for about three years, the presentations, transcripts, and et cetera um, should be in Adams indefinitely. Uh, the presentation transcripts will be indefinite, but the past rec information is three years. So hopefully that makes sense. I just wanted to get that out of the way because we've gotten that question a couple of times. So the first question for you, Commissioner, is, is there a risk that focusing on increasing nuclear safety oversight might increase costs and delay projects enough to make nuclear energy uncompetitive with more dangerous energy sources? Well, this is a great question. I'm glad, I'm glad we brought this up. And, and so, you know, what I'm talking about here is not increasing oversight. I'm talking about maintaining a strong level of oversight at plants. And, you know, we've had proposals in recent years to reduce the level of oversight. I don't think that's a good idea. Um, true efficiencies, um, focusing on risk, those are important things to do. Um, but we've seen a number of recommendations in recent years to reduce inspections, um, really focused on the kinds of cost considerations being raised here. Um, and NRC needs to be focused on safety and security. Of course, we're going to consider the costs and benefits of the actions we take. Um, but I don't think we should be making decisions about reducing oversight levels um, to try to make chance plants more profitable. That's not our role, uh, and that's not what the agency should be doing. Um, the profitability of plants should not be uh, a reason we weaken oversight uh, or perform fewer inspections at a plant. That's, uh, I think that's the wrong direction. But, of course, um, we have so many ways at the agency of taking into account the effects of our actions, and we want to balance those things. We want to be thoughtful. Um, but we're not an economic regulator. We're a safety and security regulator. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, next question. Can you address the licensee responsibility to resolve a cross-cutting issue trend before the agency is required to take action under the cross-cutting issue program? What does not put more emphasis on the importance of a good corrective action program and allow oversight and monitoring by the NRC? Well, it's, it, this, is a, this is an important issue, I think, for us to focus on, or at least one of them, you know, because we are, as I mentioned in my remarks, I don't see the reactor oversight pro, um, uh, program as static. Um, we're going to want to make changes. Um, we're going to want to assess the programs we have and think through, are they working well and as well as they could be working? Um, Cross-cutting issues, the staff started to take a look at, it, look at that program. Um, and as I mentioned, I think the idea is very good. Right now, it's very, very hard to trigger. Now, it's, it is important for licensees to have effective corrective action programs. That's one of the things um, that can be a focus area under the cross-cutting issues program. Incidentally, it's also um, an important uh, issue for uh, PI and R inspections, problem identification and resolution inspections. That's one of the key things that that um, extremely important uh, inspection looks at. And, and, you know, in recent years, there have been talks of reducing the frequency of those inspections. I don't think that's a good idea. Um, the, the, the person who asked the question is right. You know, it, a licensee's corrective action program is really vital to the safe operations of a plant. We want to make sure uh, those are working the way they should. And, um, and of course, you know, a lot, a lot depends on that. And that's uh, a big part of how um, a licensee has the opportunity to find issues and resolve them without the need for additional NRC action. But if we're going back to the cross-cutting issues program for a moment, if, for example, we see a number of instances indicating that a corrective action program isn't working the way it should, when is it appropriate for the agency to, to get more involved and, and increase oversight? Right, right now, we've set the bar very, very high uh, to the point that that program is really just not kicking in. Um, we need to strike the right balance there. And I know the staff's looking at that. And we want to think that through. We don't want it to be such a low threshold that it's being triggered all the time unnecessarily. Right? We want to find the right level. I think, I, I think it's pretty clear as the staff looks at it. The level we have now is really just too high. It just rarely, rarely triggers. Um, and 
there's no point in having a really good program there if it's not going to trigger um, uh, when you want it to. So we need to just make some thoughtful adjustments there. And, and I'm very interested, and I know the agency will be in hearing the thoughts of all stakeholders about what is the right balance to strike there? How can you make that um, a more effective program than it's been? Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, the next question is, I agree with intensifying inspections to keep us safe. In 2020, utility daily reportability events have dropped off significantly. Do you believe this is improved utility behavior or a lack of properly using the corrective action process? Well, I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. I know that the staff looks at those kinds of trends and tries to figure out what's going on there. I'll, I'll mention a related trend that I admit has worried me a bit in recent years, which is the really dramatic drop in inspection findings. We've seen that. Um, really, for the last four or five years. And um, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but it's been a steep, steep decline in inspection findings, um, much greater than you expect than from just a small number of plants um, shutting down. And um, you know, there are a lot of things that could be contributing to that. One of them could be improved performance. Um, what am I concerned about, potentially? I want to make sure that um, our inspectors are still focused on doing their jobs without barriers and making sure that if they see an issue they think should be perhaps a green finding, um, that, it gets, uh, that it gets cited if it should be, right? And so um, we wanna make sure we're, set, we're sending the right message to the staff. ROP, you know, because of the, the, the significance determination process and the color coding and everything, there's a strong risk element to it that's there, but we don't want um, a focus on risk to have an an adverse effect or an unintended consequence where we're um, not identifying green findings that should properly be identified. They may individually be very low safety significance, um, but it's important to, to be aware of them. First of all, just to resolve those individual um, findings. Um, we want to be aware of them because there could potentially be uh, more generic issues, right? We could have an issue at a plant uh, if we're not um, making everyone aware of it through a finding, are we making sure or doing the analysis we need to to make sure we don't have um, a, a more generic issue that could be applicable to other plants? Um, and it's a, you know, even this is true, I think, for white findings, but I think it's true even for greens, is it can be an indicator of trends at a plant, right? And so even if you have a number of uh, individually low safety significant items, if they're all happening at a plant, maybe in a particular program area, um, you know, it, it may be something for the agency to be looking at, right? It can, it can be um, a little bit of an early warning of potentially a, a downward trend in performance at a plant. So um, those are, you know, those are important findings. And, um, and I, when we see the numbers drop so precipitously, I think it's really incumbent upon the agency to get our arms around that and figure out what's driving that. Um, and I, I think the consensus of the staff from the last few years has been, well, it's hard to really figure it out because there are a number of contributing factors probably. And that, I think it's certainly true. It's not one thing that's causing the numbers to come down um, so steeply over the last few years. Um, but it's really a remarkable trend. And it's, as a regulator, as a safety regulator, um, my view is we need to continue to be looking closely at that and determine as best we can what is driving that. Um, and if there is anything um, that's driving it that shouldn't be, you know, green findings, for example, uh, not being cited or inspectors um, getting the sense that it's going to be such a, a hassle, for lack of a better word, to get something cited that they don't want to pursue it, you know, we need to be aware of that and make those corrections if they're needed. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, can you explain your comments on flex? NRC has completed its assessment of the new flooding hazards and will backfit the plants if FLEX cannot perform its function. So please explain why you believe FLEX is not adequately protected against up-to-date flooding hazards. Well, thanks. You know, there, there really were two, post Fukushima, there were two separate um, agency actions going on. One is the rulemaking I discussed in my remarks. Um, and that was really... Um, it was a performance-based standard, did not say you must have flex equipment at sites, but the way in which licensees meet this standard is with their flex equipment. And from the very beginning, um, the commission's view was that it was necessary for adequate protection post-Fukushima 
to ensure that that flex equipment um, and the flex strategies were sufficient to protect against the new reevaluated flooding and earthquake hazards. Um, you know, the agency made a U-turn, significant U-turn at the very end of that rulemaking and dropped that requirement and that element of, of the rule, which had always been a core element of the rule, and basically said, well, you, you know, remember those uh, out-of-date, you know, flood and earthquake hazards? You just have to have flex strategies that deal with that. Well, it did not make sense at the time. It doesn't make sense today. Uh, and if you're thinking about it through the lens of climate change, it makes even less sense when it comes to flooding, right? Because those aren't even going to be static hazards. Um, now, separately, the agency was looking, had sent out um, uh, letters requesting information, and this was, you know, the reevaluated hazards for earthquake and flooding. And that left led to the possibility that the agency would take action at a specific plant, uh, site-specific, um, to require um, modifications potentially for the new earthquake or flooding hazards. That's an important program, and there have been some things required at different plants um, on both the flooding and the earthquake side. But it was never intended to be a replacement for having a regulation that said um, effectively you have to have the flex equipment and that it has to be protected, reasonably protected from the real flooding and earthquake risks at a plant. I mean, it's just frankly silly to have a regulation that's, that doesn't require that, right? Having a regulation that says you don't need to be um, focused on the currently understood uh, risks, I think really um, misses an important safety opportunity. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Um, next question. Due to their size and cost, full-scale testing was not considered possible for most existing reactors. Can more extensive physical testing of advanced, usually much smaller, reactors help us to more quickly gain the experience level that we've gradually accumulated with extra large light water reactors? Great question. Yeah, I, I think that I think it can. And I think we're seeing, um, you know, a lot of this is still proprietary, but we have various um, uh, vendors out there looking at different advanced reactor designs of, of all different types. Um, and, you know, in the conversations I've had and what I've heard, several of them, I think, are looking uh, at test reactors. I think that um, may, may be a pretty common feature for several of these um, designs that could potentially be uh, submitted to the agency. So, yeah, I do think we'll, we'll see more of that. Um, and uh, it harkens back a little bit to, you know, decades past. Um, more at the beginning of light water reactor technology in the country. So um, I think, uh, you know, vendors will make, applicants will make their own decisions about how they want to proceed on a lot of these things. Um, some of them, uh, and, and that's both true whether or not they're going to use a test reactor, um, but also just like, um, are they going to use part 50? Are they going to use part 52? Are they going to go right to a combined license? Are they going to do a design certification? There are a lot of options um, from a regulatory point of view, um, and for, uh, from a data gathering point of view that they have. Um, and uh, I do think we're going to see more of that, though. I think there's definitely a lot of conversation about, um, about test reactors, and, and I would be surprised if we didn't see some of that. Okay. Um, the next two questions are about environmental justice. So the first one is, thanks for sharing your insights today, Commissioner Barron. Can you say more about how environmental justice intersects with issues of spent nuclear fuel storage and disposition? What procedural innovations could help in this regard? Well, that's, you know, it's, if, we're, if we're serious about environmental justice, and we should be, we need to be, um, it should be a priority for the agency. We're gonna have to take a, a really systematic look, I think, at the different areas of the agency's work. We're gonna have to look um, at spent fuel, um, but we're going to be looking at other areas. You know, it may be reactors, it may be materials, it may be fuel cycle facilities, it may be um, waste facilities, low-level waste facilities, and other things. Um, uranium recovery. We have a lot of different um, types of licensing at the agency. We're going to need to think about those issues, um, environmental justice issues, in all those contexts. And we're going to have to think about the various procedures and processes we have in place. So part of that is really just the licensing process and how we make decisions. Uh, I think it involves how we do NEPA. Right now, NEPA is the main way in which we look at environmental justice, really the only way we look at it. Um, we've confined it to NEPA. That was a decision made a while back. 
about 15 years ago. Not changed in 15 years. I think it makes sense to take a look at that question. Um, you know, we have a policy statement actually on environmental justice um, from 2004, I believe. Um, for those of you ha who haven't looked at it, take a look at it. It has not aged well. This is not a document that has aged well. Um, it, looking at it today, um, it needs a lot of work. I think it's a document that needs to be revisited. Um, there's, there are the substantive questions about how we should do the review and what the constraints are. There's also just the, for lack of a better word, you know, um, tonal issues about how important the issue is to us and to the nation. And do we want to have a policy statement that's out there that really is quite negative and focused on constraining the review as much as possible? Or do we want to start thinking broadly about what are the changes we should be thinking about making? Are there, are we having unintended impacts on disadvantaged communities with some of our processes and procedures? Um, I don't think we're going to really, it's hard to answer individual questions like this until we do that kind of review. I think it's an important thing for the staff to do, for the agency to do. And I think it's going to be just critical that we get a lot of um, stakeholder input on that, right? And um, including maybe from some of the stakeholders we don't normally hear from, right? We're going to want to hear from the broad, a broad range of stakeholders. And, um, you know, I, I think we, across the country, there are local environmental justice organizations that aren't always focused on our issues, right? Um, they, they have other things sometimes they're focused on. But I think we have a lot to learn in this area. I think we have a lot of perspectives that we don't normally hear that we're going to want to hear as we think this through. Um, I think it's, I think it's, you know, should be uh, and is really very significant and challenging. You know, I think we've got to get out of our comfort zone a little bit. We've, been, we've done things a certain way. A decision was made, um, you know, a couple decades ago to really focus it all through NEPA. We should take a look at that. Is that the right way to go? Do we want to think about it in other areas? I'm not, I'm not coming at it thinking I have all the answers about how this should all end up or what it should look like. Um, I want to hear from folks. I want to do a good, thorough review and a really open-minded review uh, about what, what we're doing, how well it's working, who's it working well for, and who's it not working well for. Um, and so there's a lot of work to be done there. And I think um, those are the kinds of questions that we should be asking as part of that review. All right, thank you. Now, the second question on environmental justice, nuclear energy generates electricity without the particulate matter emissions from fossil fuels or the impacts from the excessive mining to provide the materials used in wind and solar. It also does not require the same transmission line development to connect renewable sources to load centers. Do you recognize the clean air environment, environmental justice benefits associated with nuclear energy as part of your efforts to increase environmental justice awareness? Sure. I mean, those, you know, in terms of the, the air quality issues, that's exactly right. Um, you know, now, kind of go back to my remarks here a little bit, which is we're not, um, we're not the agency that decides resource mixes and things of that sort, right? We don't pick and choose between different types of generation, but it's absolutely the case that um, our environmental reviews, for example, need to take into account um, what are the attributes of a particular, let's say we're talking about a nuclear power plant or a nuclear reactor, what are the attributes of the reactor versus potential alternatives, right? And so, um, yeah, I think, you know, if you're talking about certain alternatives, there are significant air quality benefits from a nuclear power plant. Um, but, you know, and it's easy because we, we focus so much, you know, in our, in our conversations uh, and really even in my speech so much about uh, on the reactor side, we have to, we do have to think a little bit more broadly though, right? There are a lot of other types of licenses that we have out there um, and, and they may raise different issues. Right. And so we've seen a lot of tribal issues come up in uranium recovery context, for example. I know we whenever you have a waste facility, it brings up a lot of issues. Um, and so we we don't want to be narrowly focused, I think, on just reactors and what the issues are there. Um, and, and even though it's our job to make sure reactors are you know, really super safe, um, there are still some risks associated with that. And we do have to think about those risks from an environmental justice point of view. Um, and, you know, what communities are bearing those risks and, and how does that look? Are they, are they disproportionately um, affecting disadvantaged communities? 
Okay, um, next question, and we probably have time for maybe two more. You mm -hmm. stated that new generation nuclear technology should have additional levels of oversight until the operating history is established that supports reducing that oversight. Shouldn't that same philosophy be applied to the existing fleet with literally thousands of years of operating experience and a reduction in oversight be justified? Well, I, I think that the point I was making on advanced reactors, new reactors is this. Um, you know, the expectation I think people have is that designs coming in are going to be safer than the existing fleet. That may well be true. It would be terrific if that's true. Uh, that'd be a great development. Um, but then that poses a tough question for the agency, which are, we're all obviously going to be grappling with in the rulemaking for advanced reactors that will be going on for the next few years, but also in individual applications. And the question is, well, if, if you have a technology that's much safer, what requirements do you need and what requirements don't you need? And the point I'm making, I think, is really a modest one, which is even if it's a very safe reactor, or we think based on our current knowledge, oftentimes in the absence of significant operating experience, that it's going to be a very safe reactor, we still need to focus on defense and depth, right? And part of that is incorporated into um, the core licensing decisions. For example, the, the methodology that came out of the licensing, licensing modernization project includes issues of defense and depth. So it's not that that's ignored. But we're going to have to ask questions about how do we strike the right balance on um, emergency planning, for example, on siting restrictions that have existed, and how much of that um, should remain or go away in certain contexts with particular reactors. And I, could, I definitely see the benefit and the argument for potentially scaling some of that and, and having a more graded approach. So if you're thinking about emergency planning um, for large light water reactors, we've had 10 mile emergency planning zones. That's true for every plant in the country. Um, for certain types of, of uh, new reactors, advanced reactors, are we going to need a 10 mile emergency planning zone? I think there's a, a strong argument that we may not, right? Uh, the question is, do we go all the way back, all the way to site boundary where there's no dedicated off-site radiological emergency planning, no role for FEMA. Um, that's, that's the other extreme, right? And so um, I think for something like emergency planning, and we're going to have to think this through because I think you could have certain scenarios where may, maybe, um, you know, if you, if you had the right risk profile, um, you know, site boundary would work. But I think for a lot of, uh, a lot of facilities, particularly if you're thinking about larger advanced reactor facilities or multi-module, small modular reactors, um, we may want something in between site boundary and 10 miles. And I think this is, this is something that I was interested in hearing comment on for the rulemaking that's going on right now on emergency planning. You know, for example, is two miles the right answer? You could have a smaller um, EPZ, um, but, you would, uh, but you still have off-site emergency planning, dedicated radiological emergency planning, which I think there's a consensus is really superior to the all hazards planning that is not dedicated and focused on radiological, and you still keep a FEMA role. So is that, you know, potentially a better balance to strike? Or siting restrictions. Um, you know, we, we have siting restrictions right now, both in regulation and then um, guidance related to it. How much do we want to um, alter that potentially for um, an advanced reactor? I don't think, you know, I don't come at it with a, with a, firm answer to what that looks like, but I think we have to really ask ourselves for a new technology that might have, you know, no operating experience, is the agency's position really that there should be no emergency planning off-site and that it could be located, um, you know, immediately adjacent to a large metropolitan area? I, I have real doubts about whether that would really be the right answer. I don't know that that strikes the right balance. There are tough issues there to think through. I want to thank you, Commissioner, for your thoughtful comments and your candor. We're out of time for questions, but thank you so much for your remarks and for all the answers you provided to your questions. And with that, we will close our session. Thank you very much. Thanks so much.